everyone. Welcome. I know that there's still a line, but we're going to go ahead and get started with our panel discussion. And, uh, you know, you'll be able to see and hear from where you're at and then get a seat and enjoy. Uh, well, my name is Lauren Hildreth, and I work with Trailblazers. And I'm here with this incredible panel and a special guest, Meg. Uh, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But Trailblazers is here in Northwest Arkansas and we're the leading uh, advocacy infrastructure um, organization relating to trails, cycling, and active transportation. We've been working with People for Bikes. We work with a lot of different community partners and we're super excited to be here tonight with Shift 2022. So thank you to People for Bikes and Shift 22 and all of you being here for it. Also thanks to Kohler, uh, there's some quite a few Kohler staff and Peel Compton members out here tonight and letting us use this venue and setting it up like this, which is not normal. And then also for our Pass the Mic partners and overall organization partners, Bike POC, we've got B Apple here and Kim C in the crowd. I am going to hand it over to Meg though for a quick introduction. Hey, you guys. Oh, hey, I'm Dr. Meg Fisher. So who's worked with a physical therapist? Right? So what are we all going to say? Have nice posture. Take some deep breaths. All right. Stay with me. Um, I'm really grateful to be here tonight at Shift 2022. Um, I want to say who's excited about the BAMP Film Festival? Yo! Who's going to watch it? Yeah. You're going to watch me. So I'm going to be on a, um, in a film called High Road, which is brought to you by Outride, which is a partner and works in conjunction with People for Bikes. And I'm really excited to bring paracycling. Um, who knows what paracycling is? Thank you. Not everyone all at once. It's overwhelming when you're all clapping. <laughs> so I believe we all belong on bikes. Doesn't matter your shape, size, color, uh, ability, physical ability between your ears or of your physical body. We are all more capable than we know. And I think we're all here with People for Bikes to bring people to a sport that is enabling. It allows us to explore our abilities and redefine who we are. So um, have a wonderful night tonight where we have an amazing panel. And um, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. Dr. Meg Fisher. All right, just a couple housekeeping things is there are multiple bathrooms. So there's some um, porta johns over here as well as bathrooms in the building under the pavilion. Um, food waste and all of your trash, your recycling. No one can hear you back there. Okay. I'm so sorry. Who do I That's okay. To? One of the production. <laughs> um, so food waste, there's a station next to the Wooden Spoon um, dessert truck, and they have recycling. They take all of your food waste, your plates, uh, your utensils, your recycling, everything for them. And then there's also hot hands around, so uh, if you need to warm your hands. Otherwise, there's heaters. The white tent is a heater tent, so if you're getting a little too cold and take a rotation through there. Um, but otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and enjoy the panel discussion. I'm going to hand it over here to B. Apple with Bike POC. Hey, everybody. Um, what? Yeah. Hey, y'all, there's cushions up here, so get comfortable. Um, we're about to settle in for some spicy convos. So, <laughs> so if anybody knows me, you know that how this is going to go. Um, <laughs> um, Pass the Mic is not just about content, it's the community. We're always striving to create a place where we can elevate the voices of marginalized communities through storytelling, the expression of our creativity, and a safe place to be vulnerable with each other. With that said, um, Lauren, can you flip to the community agreements? Next page, yes. Um, I'll let y'all read through, but I'm going to touch on just a few community agreements that are really important as we're engaging in topics that are really sensitive and hard to talk about and require a lot of bravery for those of us sitting up on this stage to say the things that we're going to say. And it takes a lot of bravery for y'all to be sitting here in the audience and being willing to learn and to listen. So I appreciate everybody who's here. Um, a couple 
things that I consider to be life hacks as we're entering into this work is engaging in yes and thinking. As, sorry, <laughs> as we kind of engage in conversations and talk about the history of our built environment and our experiences, we're gonna have some uncomfortable moments because some of the things that we say are contrary to the things that you've been told um, in your life. And uh, I th would invite all of us to sit with that discomfort and know deep in your heart that the existence of all of our different experiences doesn't invalidate your own experience and that the process of engaging in this work is about learning to expand your heart and your mind to hold space for more than one reality at a time. So with that said, <clears throat> the first thing that I want to be really clear about is that as we're engaging in conversations that we trust the intent that we're bringing into the room um, but that we acknowledge the impact that our words and that the systems that we exist in have on each other. Um, when we're engaging in conversations with each other about these topics, I would ask that we avoid implicit bias and avoid harmful language that is ableist, ageist, racist, and gendered. And I also ask that we don't shame anybody, that we work towards collective understanding, and that we recognize that we're all just humans navigating a very imperfect system imperfectly and to hold space for each other and um, just really give us all a pat on the back for doing this work because it's not easy. Um, just a little uh, sidebar, Bike POC grew out of a Black Lives Matter solidarity ride Kim and I hosted in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. We were longing for a safe place to process the emotional and physical upheaval we were experiencing as women of color e existing in Northwest Arkansas. I'm incredibly grateful to Trailblazers, People for Bikes, the Walton Family Foundation, Kohler, and the community of folks we have connected with over the last few years. What we have been able to spark is incredible and we wouldn't be here without y'all's support. Um, like I said earlier, Pass the Mic is also about community. In that spirit, I'm gonna very quickly talk about what each of these folks means to me. We have all had that very human experience of drowning mentally, physically, emotionally, and at various points in this anti-racism journey, meeting each of these people was a lifeline of shared experience, camaraderie, and values, so thank you. I'm gonna start with Wes, cause he's an Arkansas boy. <laughs> um, growing up in Arkansas, I've lived here since 1993. I really appreciate Wes's perspective and I really understand the places and the people that he's like, that he comes from. Um, and I know that in the midst of the upheaval of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and figuring out how to navigate all of these spaces, hearing Wes speak so clearly and confidently and with conviction about how systemic racism shows up in our built environment was so refreshing and I'm so grateful that it came across when it did um, because you know navigating the challenges of living in the South and dealing with you know the systemic you know, barriers that are in place for marginalized communities, it can be really exhausting. And seeing people like Wes doing the damn thing is like really awesome. Um, Rasan, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rasan, uh, I first met him thanks to Gary Vernon and Oz Trails. Um, we had our first pass the mic together and when we started talking about kind of our shared experience growing up on opposite ends of the US, he's West Coast, I'm East Coast. Um, <laughs> but we both grew up in inner cities and experienced uh, the under-resourcing of the black and brown communities and what that looks like on a personal level and the slow motion violence of gentrification and um, yeah, all the things. But what I saw from him and his experience and what he's done is just how far and fast you can go 
and that gives me a lot of hope and I'm grateful to him for all the work that he does in the community. Um, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. <laughs> um, so, and I can speak for myself and a, and a few other members of the Trailblazers team when we first encountered her at the Good Road Safe Road Summit. Um, again, we're all navigating this new, this ecosystem. We're navigating this world and the challenges in it and trying to make it better. And uh, Rachel just blew the doors off in that discussion and just brought so much enlightenment around her experience as a lawyer and an advocate. And I'm really excited to have her tell her story because she's incredibly inspiring, not just as you know a cycling advocate, but as an Asian woman. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go into each of these guys because I want them to explain their experience because I think as we as they explain their experience and talk about the work that they do, y'all will really see why they're here at the table and what we're trying to accomplish. So Wes, can you talk about why you're here, what you do, and your perspective that you're bringing on bike culture? For sure. Um, mic, mic check. Any, anyone? I can't hardly see you anyway, so thumbs up really don't matter. Um, I'm just going to assume you can hear me. So thank you, thank you. So um, bring it in, I heard that. So, um, so I'm a, my background is in municipal planning. Uh, I stumbled my way into city planning. Um, didn't intend to be there, but I've spent all of my professional life doing city planning work. Now I work for an organization called the Urban Land Institute, and uh, I, I currently have been given the the um, the wonderful benefit of, of leading the district council, one of 53 district council nonprofit chapters for ULI throughout the country. And so it allowed me to kind of come up out of my silo of planning and begin to see the built environment in even more comprehensive ways and understand it. My journey into advocating for built environments that more equitably serve all of our community members was not by design any more than my career itself was. I'm a I'm a product, I'm a farm boy uh, near East Arkansas on the edge of the Delta, not not far, not, well, between Cabot and Des Arc, if anyone knows where that is, east side of Little Rock. Um, I came through Little Rock, uh, but suburbia, I ended up in Conway, suburbia. I had a pretty, I had a pretty conventional uh, suburban white boy life. And nothing about my upbringing should have led me to care so damn much about built environments that better serve everybody uh, it's just been an almost 20 year journey and uh and I, I like i like to think that's a powerful way to get there i didn't seek out to become an advocate i didn't i didn't grow up feeling the need to lead in in any given way i just slowly learned and through osmosis and a, a career journey i came to understand that our built environment um, as powerful as it is it it can be div divisive, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing tonight some of the ways that our built environment may not be serving us all, and and why that is. What is the history, and what are the decisions behind the cities within which we live that are interrupting our ability to reach our full potential as humans? Thank you, Wes. Rachel, can you? <laughs> um. I grew up in Baltimore and went to college in New York City. Um, and when I got out of college, I was writing literacy programs for marginalized communities. Uh, slowly made my way from New York all the way to Florida following the bicycle crash epidemic. Um, my entrance into advocacy came from a personal experience. I used to race long course triathlon for Team USA. In 2015, I was struck by a woman driving an S-Class Mercedes who dragged me for about 45 feet still clipped into to my bike and then proceeded to get out of her vehicle and scream at me. Um, I understood the disparity between being marginalized out of the saddle and I didn't know what that was like in the saddle until I had that experience. Um, my partner, Peter Wilborn, he's here today. He's the founding attorney of Bike Law. 
He lived in West Africa for several years and then moved to Geneva, where he wrote humanitarian policy for the United Nations. In 1998, his brother Jim was killed while riding his bike. And Peter, being an attorney, um, was responsible for retaining counsel to represent his deceased brother's young widow and estate. When Peter met with that lawyer, the lawyer asked Peter if Jim had a DUI. And Peter said, no, why would you ask that question? And that lawyer said, well, why else would a grown man be on a bike? And in that moment, that was the catalyst for creating something out of whole cloth that takes a completely different and comprehensive approach to creating and cultivating a culture of better biking for everybody who rides. We now have a very large family. We have two boys who are biological and seven adopted West African sons. And my experience as a woman of color and my experience as the mother of black African children has given me a significantly different perspective about what it means to create an equitable culture for everybody. So we've devoted our lives to creating a better system and recognizing the problems and hoping to be part of a comprehensive solution. Uh-oh. Son, you're up. All right, I just have one housekeeping rule. Could I please get anyone from People for Bikes to get everyone in the back to come forward? Um, because we are making a shift here in 22, and I think it's very important if we're going to make that shift that we listen and we learn and we enrich each other. So the conversations we're going to have tonight are very enriching, and we need to listen. So don't be afraid. Come on up. Let's talk to each other and learn something tonight. All right, I got that out of the way. Um, my name is Rasan. I'm born and raised in Compton, California, and I was a unicorn on the block who fell into the sport of cycling at 11 years old, and it changed my life forever. Um, I won't get into too many details because I am speaking tomorrow about my experience uh, growing up through the sport of cycling. Uh, but my whole mission right now, and it has been for the last 11 years, is to encourage and inspire inner city youth um, to rise above their circumstances. And I focus on education, music, and sports. I understand that cycling is not for everyone. However, cycling is a pathway to a lot of beautiful things. You meet a lot of beautiful people like we have here. Um, but, you know, it also, like Rachel said, could be very uh, deadly. And um, my goal is just to enhance their life. It's often said that my counterpartners live in a bubble. And I, I can argue that my the people who look like me also live in a bubble. And I want to pop that bubble and make sure that they explore. They leave the surrounding cities and they come to Bentonville and they're not feeling uh, marginalized or uh, inferior to come hang out and ride whatever bike they have in such a beautiful area where they can enjoy cycling. So that's been my mission ever since I stopped. Well, I was still racing when I started the foundation. Um, I was going pretty fast. I'm 10 time national champion, but I think it was more important to, um, to my community. I felt good about giving back and I've dedicated my life to it over the last 11 years. Thanks, Rasan. Um, Lauren, can you go to the intersectional advocacy slide real fast? Just one thought as we're going into this conversation and you're listening to the perspectives of the folks up on the stage and also thinking about your own experience in relation to the topics that are talked about. I wanna point out that we all exist somewhere on this wheel and sometimes during our lives we exist at different places along this wheel. So we need to recognize that the perspectives that are being shared up on this stage are by no means complete. We are working towards creating a future where all of these perspectives down to the most vulnerable person are taken to account when we're talking about infrastructure and we're talking about our built environment and we're talking about creating a more equitable cycling ecosystem. But I just want that to be in, keep that in mind and I'm gonna read out a quote from one of my favorite, favorite philosophers and authors and poets. 
and it really sums up what intersectional advocacy is. It says, you do not have to be me in order for us to fight alongside each other. I do not have to be you to recognize that our wars are the same. What we must do is commit ourselves to some future that in can include each other and to work towards that future with the particular strengths of our individual identities. And in order for us to do this, we must allow each other our differences at the same time as we recognize our sameness. Wes, we're gonna jump right in. Um, let's go to the slides, uh, Wes's slides talking about um, maps in our built environment. <clears throat> That's the first slide is actually a map, a red line map of Los Angeles. All right. Um, but we've got redlining maps of Little Rock. And so I want you From to just uh, go right there. Oh Next yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll spare you the full TED talk or the full lecture on redlining. Um, if you don't know the practice of redlining, um, I definitely encourage you to investigate. It is a, is a piece of history in our country that everybody deserves to know because it's so it, it is it is incredibly structural and it continues to shape our cities today um, it's also important to recognize who we used to be so that we know who we are and who we can become um, from the built environment point of view redlining uh, ultimately classified high risk versus low risk when it came to the federal government insuring mortgages this is going back to the 1930 uh, 1930s. So here you can see Little Rock. This is where I grew up most most of my adolescence. And you can see in green and blue, these are considered favorable neighborhoods that are low risk or low hazard to the federal government insuring mortgage lending. Um, and then in yellow and red, you can see maps that are high risk. Um, I'll give you one guess how they delineated who was considered high risk versus who was considered low risk. So for 40 years, this practice persisted, the practice of redlining, of classifying people by race and income. Um, and it had the, the, the terrible, um, absolutely designed um, outcome of making, making poor people even poorer. This is, this is a coming out of the Great Depression when virtually everybody was poor. This was part of the New Deal. Um, and it allowed some people who, in the blue, who were in the blue and the green colors to achieve multi-generational wealth through property ownership and everyone who's many, many who are in the yellow and red, um, never achieved multi-generational wealth. So 40 years later, next slide, 40 years later, we get to the urban renewal. Um, click forward to me till we see the interstate of, of Little Rock. All right, so urban renewal process, the urban renewal, the Great Society, LBGA's Great Society of the 1960s became massive transportation money in the 1970s. And this money was burning a hole in the pocket of government officials. And when they had to decide how to spend it, they decided to put it in the infrastructure, into an uh, interstate system, uh, much of it. Well, most of the interstates have already connected the states, you know, the, the, the years following Eisenhower. So where, 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 where's left to build interstates? Well, let's build them in the city so that the white people who have all moved to the suburbs can more easily get to the central business district and punch the clock nine to five and get back out. We can also do this little thing called urban renewal. We can remove blight. So how one classifies blight is pretty interesting. I want to draw your attention to the red lines on this map that are the interstate corridors for the city of Little Rock. And I want to go back one slide and I want to look at where they penciled them in. I'll spare you the full TED talk. There's a lot here, but, but it shouldn't take for, especially for anyone that understands Little Rock, it shouldn't take um, much effort to see where the lines are, um, how the red interstate lines, especially that southern east-west one that we call Interstate 630, cut the blue and the red neighborhoods, I'm sorry, the blue and the green neighborhoods apart from the yellow and red ones. Now you may be saying, Wes, why are you showing me crap that was 80 or 90 years ago, and crap that was 50 or 60 years ago? Why does this matter today? Let's click forward another slide and I'm gonna show you where, uh, how segregated Little Rock continues to be until this day. So blue on this map are where white people live or census tracts and blocks that are predominantly white residents and green on this map are census blocks and tracts that are pro primarily black residents. Um, we can keep clicking back and forward through the slides. Um, I'll save you the, the time. Um, the redlining that was done in the 1930s that corresponds to the urban renewal infrastructure projects of the 1960s and 70s made Little Rock more segregated today hundred years after the Jim Crow era than we were in the decades following the end of slavery. Let's click forward one more. This is a dot map. These are individual residents of the city of Little Rock. It, this tells a crystal clear story about who lives where. Now, why does this matter to cyclists? 
I'll just pose it to you. I, I want you to also know that 239 cities uh, were required by the Federal Housing Administration to do red line maps beginning in 1934. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, virtually every one of those same 239 metro areas all got a piece of that federal transportation money and called it urban renewal and destroyed black neighborhoods and pumped interstates right through the middle of the city. Um, I just use Little Rock as a case study because it's my hometown and it's right here in the state of Arkansas, but I'm telling you there's 238 other examples and they all tell the same story. Now, looking at this map of Little Rock at the green versus black, you have to ask yourself, where do you feel like the wealth has been accrued 100 years later? If you had to guess who owns multi-generational wealth through home ownership that was achieved 90 years, beginning 90 years ago, and who doesn't hold multi-generation home ownership wealth, who needs bikes, and who likes bikes? Where do you think the bulk of Little Rock's cycling infrastructure is going? Is it going into the green areas or is it going into the blue areas? I'll, I'll stop here um, without going into a full lecture, but I definitely encourage you to ask your yourselves the same questions about the same cities you live in and consider how infrastructure choice and I hear we're using interstates but it could be the Arkansas River how are is our natural and our artificial land how do our natural and artificial landforms how are they being applied or leveraged to create segregation in our built environments and how is that impacting wealth power and choice today thanks Wes um, Rachel, can you, so that's a great thread to talk about the next component of this culture that we're talking about. So Wes, you touched on the development of interstates and the creation of our current highway system. Rachel, as an attorney who represents cyclists involved in all the things, can you talk about the state of our built environment and how that affects the work that you do? It's, <clears throat> it's really interesting. Um, the, the the bike has always been a symbol of status, right? And we see it in what we do in our work very, very often. Even though women, and specifically women of color, are responsible for the greatest increase in ridership in US history. We are the least represented people when we talk about the cycling demographic. Most people identify the bike as a tool for sport. We feel that there is only one thing worse than being oppressed, and that's being invisible. The majority of the people that we represent, all people on bikes, we believe that if you push the pedals around, you're a cyclist. We have people who are incredibly fast on a bike, and we have people who are incredibly slow. But the reality is, is that the intended purpose for those of us who are utilitarian cyclists, we are long forgotten in a lot of these conversations. The majority of the people we represent are white. USA Cycling did a study in 2021 in which over half of the cycling members were white, over 60% were men, and over 70% were middle-aged. So even though we know that there are groups of people who are responsible for the golden age of bicycling, they don't know to call us when they are targeted, ticketed, charged, struck, killed. They don't know what their rights or responsibilities are on the roadways. And most of the time, in neighborhoods like the ones that you're describing, you're not gonna see protected bike lanes or sharrows. There are not going to be, there, you're gonna find substandard width lanes, um, you know, shoulders and, and things that, that are not well maintained where you cannot ride. And in these places, we have cyclists of color who are ticketed, and oftentimes those tickets are not actually meant to punish them for something they're doing on a bike, but instead as the gateway because they assume they're doing something else. So there's a convergence of myriad of things, uh, all of which are inequitable that we are dealing with. But it's interesting because in places like Charleston, South Carolina, or Louisville, Kentucky, or Compton, or wherever it might be, all of these suburban communities that you're mentioning, when we have people who can collect generational wealth as they move out of the cities and into exurban and suburban areas, what we're left with are a group of people who do need to use the bike, 
who don't have a say as to what happens with the development of infrastructure and who are suffering more than anybody else. And I think the general rule of thumb needs to be that riding a bike isn't going to be safe for someone dressed in plastic on a $10,000 carbon fiber bicycle if it's not safe to put a kid who's five or our grandparents to the market on a bike for its intended purpose. Um, Rasan, can you talk a little bit, given you know what we're talking about in terms of you know the built environment, the experience of cyclists on the road, and 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 in their built environments? Like, can you talk a little bit about your story and your experience growing up, but that also like the what you do at Bahati Foundation and how you see built environment and laws around cyclists affecting the communities that you work with? Yeah, um, I, in a way, like I call myself a unicorn because in a way, I didn't find cycling on the road first. I was actually introduced to velodrome racing. So I was on a track and very safe environment unless you cause harm to yourself, right? Um, and so I had no idea what a road bike was, what a mountain bike was. All I know is that I was in awe that it was a bunch of white dudes riding on this velodrome with funny outfits on. And I was like, this is stupid. How could you do this? But I was forced to do it and literally fell in love with the sport. Um, and it honestly, it wasn't really the sport. It was the camaraderie that was building in that community there. Um, I tell this story all the time about how, you know, I'm, I'm riding bikes and have this common uh, thing with people from all over Southern California. I was poor, but there were people there from Malibu that had the best bikes. But when we got on the bike, we were just having a great old time. And as a kid, you know, being 11, 12, 13 years old, I just thought that was the coolest thing. It wasn't even the bike. I couldn't wait to go back to the track and hang out with people, you know. Um, and so I was oblivious to everything else. But as I found the road, it was a huge shock not only to me, but to my family, you know. Um, they didn't know what to do. So my parents made a huge sacrifice and actually moved from Compton to Carson, which gave us a little better access to, to riding. Um, and I look back on that, it actually makes me very emotional because they didn't have to do that. I grew up with five sisters and a brother, but for some reason, my parents has, had the forethought to say, this cycling thing is changing our son. We should really you know, give it a lot of energy. And honestly, cycling changed, uh, saved my life. So. Um, as I grew up and started to race on the road, that's when I started to realize, one, I was a raisin in milk. There was no one out there that looked like me. And then, two, I couldn't ride anywhere, you know? And my, my parents couldn't take me. I used Justin Williams, who may, some of you may have uh, listened to today. The things that he accomplished on the bike is absolutely incredible given where we grew up. Literally light after light after light, and he's beating guys who live in the most geographically best place to ride a bike. I mean, that's incredible. And I was in the same boat. So you look back on it, you're like, man, I didn't even have to live in Boulder. Like, I grew up in the hood and I still beat you, you know? Um, so that is just, it deserves a lot of credit, seriously, because it's, uh, it's a sport, as you know, the more time you put in, the more you get out of it. And so when you're racing from light to light or you go out and PCH, it takes you almost two hours to get there and you ride for two hours and you have to ride two hours back light the light it's not only is it physically challenging it's mentally challenging to do that over and over and over again to be at your best um and so that's why you know through all the years of me racing i never gave up on the hope of being you know at the top of the game and racing the tour de france and doing all these bigger races and i didn't make it there and you know i would always say it wasn't in my cards it was in my cards to be where i am here today speak to you about my experiences get kids involved into the sport and change the narrative about cycling in the hood i'll tell you a quick story when i was in middle school i had to carry a duffel bag with my backpack and it had all of my cycling equipment in it you know my helmet the funny shoes the tights with the pad like no one knows what this stuff is so i went to a school in the hood you couldn't just walk around with an extra bag so the security would go on my bag and then one day a teacher wanted to go on my bag and i said no and she's like well if you can't if i can't go in your bag you go to the principal's office i was so embarrassed about what i was doing as a cyclist you know like no one was riding bikes at my school um that i got suspended from school so many times and no one understood it except my parents 
you know, uh, students didn't understand it, teachers. It wasn't until I made the national team and I went to Argentina in a race and won all these medals and I made the LA Times paper. And people saw that in my neighborhood and they were just like, you race bikes, you get to go to out of the country? And I was like, shit, that is cool, huh? And I came out of my shell. And so I say that to say, and we often say this phrase, representation actually does matter. And so it's important that we're out there. Uh, it's important that we have groups that are in the hood, in the inner city, riding bikes to show them it is possible. And we do have challenges. Um, I live in an area that don't have bike lanes. Um, they don't care about bike lanes. Like you say, you got dragged under a car and then yelled at. I, something similar you know, happened to me. So we have to as individuals we all have friends that are not cyclists if even if it's our neighbor we have to educate them it only takes one and then hopefully they educate the next and then it's a snowball effect so fast forwarding to the foundation like i said my goal and what we've been doing is just inspiring the youth uh we give bikes to kids in the hood we give them helmets we have um dental screenings and things for uh for the families and not only the kids it's important that we get everyone involved because i think a healthy household is better than a healthy child of course we want our children to be healthy but we also need the entire household to be healthy because if we can do it together we'll move faster forward together thanks Rasan. i appreciate your perspective so much um lauren can we go to the slide with the um the bronx riders um rachel in one of our earlier conversations um we talked about um the perception like the who is a cyclist and and how we need to debunk our you know the power structures like existing notion of who that is and a really powerful thing happened even at this at the summit is that I got to sit through a, a movie screening last night and got to see this really amazing clip about the wheelie boys up in the Bronx, which is where I'm from. And something that struck me and that tied back to our conversation is a lot of what these kids were talking about is how they how the bike for them is transformational and that for them it has gotten them out of really awful situations and has given them hope in situations where they shouldn't have any. But at the same time, it's this double-edged sword because the, the bike is something that makes them a target for law enforcement. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, I think that there's, there's two different things and they can coexist and I think they're very nuanced. And one is that if you are a, well, let's start Let's back up. Crime is a symptom of two things, poverty and proximity. So if you go into an inner city neighborhood that consists of people of color, then you're gonna find people of color who are committing crimes. If you go to Western Maryland and to a trailer park, you're gonna find a bunch of meth heads and opioid dealers. I mean, it, it really is that simple, right? There are more differences amongst us then there are differences between defined groups of people, right? So it's all the same. The factors, the, the things that cause these inequities are all, all the same. So on one hand, I think that we do have an element of racism within policing, for sure, uh, where we have bad apples who are going to target people of color just because they're bigots. The same time, we have good police officers who are uneducated, who don't have the resources, who have not been given an opportunity to be part of a redemption story. And they oftentimes will use uh, children of color or people of color in lower economic communities um, and, and them being on a bike as a gateway to try and figure out if they've done something else. It's not necessarily that riding a bike is a problem, it's that it makes them more vulnerable and exposed. Wes, um, when we talk about built environment, and I think it's really important as we're talking about all of these different communities, I think so much of like the problems that are existing is because we don't know each other and we've intentionally been separated from each other. Wes, can you talk about like built environment and the segregation and how that plays into the perceived differences that we have e with each other that keep us from really building bridges across communities to like tackle these solutions? 
Yeah, um, for sure. So, so I'll pick up where I left off on, uh, left off on redlining. So during the white flight era of urban renewal, um, the dawn of the automobile, uh, and the blight of our inner cities, um, that that really created white suburbs and black inner cities. I mean, it really does tie back to federal policies. Like this is de jure segregated policies. This is, these are choices that were made to segregate our cities, um, and that persists to this day. Again, I encourage you to to investigate. Uh, Color of Law is an excellent book, but there are a number out there. Investigate a little bit more about the history of of federal segre of using the finance structures of commercial lending to segregate America, um, using federal transportation and housing money to segregate America, and then ask yourself if we're still seeing the fingerprints all over the landscape to this day. But as far as the built environment, I, I can think more granular than that. So. So we probably all have in our cities and our communities right now streets where the prom predominant architectural feature visible from the public realm is a garage. Right? We come down these streets, we call them snout houses in city planning vernacular, but the garage sticks out further than the front door. There's probably people I'm speaking to right now that live in a house like this, where the front door is, is just a compact little shadowy alcove um, on a make-believe front porch that really is not designed for people. And the, the two-car garage just quietly eats your car. And where do we go? We slip through the house. We go into our backyard that's probably surrounded by six-foot privacy vents. We don't talk to a damn person unless they've been invited into our sanctuary. Um, I'll give you a, an anecdote. So I, I, I formerly, before moving to Northwest Arkansas, lived in downtown Conway and I had a house uh, on a corner. I had a six-foot privacy fence. And the first thing I, you know, I actually lived there for a couple of years. Um, it's, it's important to the story. Um, I didn't know my neighbor. Uh, her name was Farrell. She was real kind. She worked at the VA retiree. I didn't know her until I tore down that fence and put in a, a, sh a, a little wire fence. And all of a sudden, we started exchanging Christmas gifts. I used to tell my, I used to teach planning at, at the collegiate level, and I used to tell my students that, that, you know, we'd go in with a Google aerial and we would say, you know, if aliens were investigating the United States of America post-World War II and looking at the cities in suburbia, they might assume that the automobile is the predominant life form on our planet because when you look around at our cities, it is obvious. It does not take a graduate degree in planning. Um, it, it does not. It is very obvious that we prioritize the movement of cars, not humans. And oh, I'm sorry. There are more parking. There are more parking spots in the U.S. than there is available housing. Uh, yeah, we make housing incredibly expensive, and we guarantee parking is free and available. Uh, that's we got that that ass backwards, you guys. Like, did we 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 offer housing for our cars by right? And we don't offer housing by right. Uh, don't don't get me off on a third TED talk. Um, <laughs> our, if you just start to uh, if you just start to absorb your built environment, what you will discover is that we have made a series of decisions over the last half century or so that have absolutely um, disconnected. They have they have eroded social bonds at the neighborhood level. We do not have street life. When you don't have street life, you lose security. You lose a sense of um, of community. Um, you probably all, I know I do, I live in Fayetteville on the edge of downtown, but I don't know very many people on my street. We have a little annual party and it's nice to say hi and exchange cookies, but like we don't really know one another and it's by and large, I believe, informed in many ways because of the design of our streets and our homes. And um, yeah, I, I think there are, there's a lot to learn if, if we looked at the neighborhoods and cities of pre-World War II, and we look at the neighborhoods and cities and architectures since World War II, really the dawn of the auto, and their night and day difference. And I believe it's taken 80 years to screw our cities up, and it's gonna take about that long to get it right, but there's no better time to start than, to, it's like planting a tree. When's the right time to plant a tree? Either 20 years ago or today. I feel that way about about uh, a built environment that better connects us. and. Um, and allows us to be stronger communities. Rachel, can you talk a little bit about, um, so, cause like we're super invested in solutions here. Like, you know, we're giving you guys and we're giving all of y'all in the audience kind of a really basic 101. Like we could talk for hours on this subject. I mean, this is generational work. So I think we have to put that in context of where we are right now. But like there are things that we can do and there are things that we need to be paying attention to and that they're pretty easy for us to do on a regular basis. So Rachel, can you talk a little bit about 
you know, what you're seeing is like the vanguard of like how we're going to, how we need to be talking about this, how we need to be incorporating other people's perspectives and moving forward into creating this. Yeah, I, I think that <clears throat> just, I, well, I can't see anybody, but before when I could see uh, everybody, we, we looked like we were here gathering, you know, in fellowship and everybody is here to massage the things that we have in common as opposed to looking at the things that we, you know, might find to be different about one another. Um, and generally, I think that is the most important thing, right? So when we talk about effective advocacy, if bike advocacy were successful, none of us would be here. <laughs> and that's the reality. It's not that we don't have good ideas or that we don't have a plan to execute that could be effective. It's that it's very, very difficult to affect change when we're talking about these things inside of an echo chamber. So I think that, you know, if we look at things from a legislative perspective, right, um, Peter has spent a lot of time, you know, testifying in front of the House and the Senate, lobbying for more progressive and protective bike legislation. And, you know, part of the success in doing that is kind of hooking our caboose to somebody else's train, right? Finding out how, you know, we're always gonna catch more flies with honey, but how we make what we're saying and the goal that we have relatable to a larger or more powerful group of people. For example, when we talk about, you know, a vulnerable road user law, which would essentially give law enforcement and prosecutors the ability to hold reckless and irresponsible drivers accountable when they strike, harass, kill a bicyclist. Um, the best way to do that is to say, look, we're also talking about crossing guards and construction workers and police officers and most importantly, motorcyclists because they too are not encapsulated in three, four, five thousand 5,000 pounds of steel. So that's just an example of a way that we can break free from some of this enclosed or encapsulated conversation that we all have uh, you know, pretty regularly and effectively, but the reality is, is that we're trying to infiltrate and affect someone else's opinion or perspective who doesn't sit in the saddle who doesn't push the pedals around. Um, I think that riding a bike is probably one of the most important things in the world, right? When we talk about scalable, sustainable, uh, fiscal health, just physical, mental, emotional health, when we talk about the growth of our communities, um, the bike is an integral part of that, right? Human-powered transportation is super, super important. Um, and so finding ways to get more people on bikes, things like what Rashawn is doing over here with educating children and, and, and providing that type of representation, the things that Wes is doing to undermine some of these very antiquated and um, you know, bigoted policies and, and, and engineering practices. But most importantly, if you can get somebody who doesn't see the value in riding a bike in the saddle, sometimes it's important for someone to have that experience because what we have learned in representing people who have been struck by motorists or who have been targeted by the police, regardless of the color of their skin or their, their gender, um, oftentimes it is the very first time that a middle-aged white man understands what it means to be a second-class citizen. Rasan, um We've done a lot of work together, and I love seeing how you engage with communities at multiple levels. Like, what do you see as being kind of the next good thing to do in your work? Uh, it's a lot, um, but I'm a big believer in crawling before walking. So it's okay to start small. Uh, this is very important. This is very impactful. So everyone here, you should give yourselves a round of applause for even being here in the cold. Yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, we do so much out in LA and sometimes it feels like it's not enough. Um, one of the things that uh, my, my business partner on the for-profit side is here, Ken, and we started something about five years ago. Um, so if you know anything about LA, LA have these little pockets, right? You're in LA, then you have the west side. The west side is now coming towards the south side. It's like, no, this, this is the hood. This is not the west side. Um, and then you have like, the South Bay, and then you have Orange County, right? And we have this freeway called the 605, and we both, on both sides of the 605, north and south, we have this funny coming. It's like, oh no, I don't go north of the Orange Curtain, or I don't go south of the Orange Curtain. And we, ha I had this epiphany, I'm taking credit for this, Ken, wherever you're at. Um, 
we go out on a ride and we ride hard and we don't get to know each other. We only know the people in our immediate community. And then we break off and we go our separate ways. And so the idea was to bridge this gap between all these different neighborhoods and come together. It's like, why are we so segregated? And we all love cycling. So we started a softball tournament just one day out of the blue. He's like, you know what? Bring your club. Leave your liker at home. We're going to play softball. Let's see how bad of an athlete you are. And it was so much fun. Like, cyclists are not that coordinated. Um, and everyone brought their coolers out, and we just had a good old time. And that morphed into something where we were bringing people to a park every summer and having thousands of people hanging out just like this, eating barbecue, having uh, uh, like just park games and water balloon fights. And that morphed into something we started last year. I said, Ken, oh, I don't know where he went, um, a New Year's gala. And this was another way to bring more people in. So leave your uniform, your costume at home. You're going to dress up. And we put on tuxedos. And everyone dressed up, had the nice gowns on. They spent money getting their hair done. And we had the most fun. We're doing it again, January 28th, if you're in California. Um, but it's a way to bring our community together off the bike. I think these environments, these events are so important for the sport because, again, when we're on the bike, we don't get to know each other. We just want to show how strong we are, mm -hmm. right? And that's not really what sport is all about. Um, so... Do things off the bike. Uh, bring the community together. Don't be afraid to bridge gaps. Um, because I, what I what I realize and what I know is that once we get to know each other, those barriers come down like tremendously. You know, it's the same. Once you open your mouth, you let the people know who you are. It's 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 that we're all intelligent. Let's let's spread that love across all counties, all cities, all states. I, I'm gonna jump in real quick because, like, you know. Part of the work that I'm doing is not just up here moderating, but like working with people like y'all to like create events because we're doing this in Northwest Arkansas. So like we have to remember that we're on like the leading edge of integrating the sport of cycling in a in, in a place that isn't that doesn't necessarily want to even see us out there on the roads, on the gravel roads, on the trails. So. Like, I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of as a region, as an Arkansan, as someone who deeply loves this place, the importance of getting behind and supporting organizations and people from those communities that are doing the work. And I know y'all had amazing barbecue and I'm gonna call them out because we've had such a wonderful time just working with them. Kim and I work with um, this nonprofit as part of our um, cohort of uh, marginalized p folks led nonprofits that are going through um, an incubation process with the Ideals Institute and Walton Family Foundation. Anyway, um, Lighthouse Solutions, Stacy, Nate, um, Patsy, y'all did an amazing job. I want to tell you this group. <laughs> Um, when I talk about like co-creating the future and how Bike POC is trying to position itself in this ecosystem, it's really important that we uplift the people in the communities that are doing the work already. Too many times in cycling or in other areas of this work, like there are people that are invested in taking solutions from communities of color and then repackaging it without really like getting buy-in and actually doing the hard work that it takes to make events really inclusive, to make infrastructure really inclusive. Especially Bentonville, like let's focus on creating events that are like uplifting communities of color because what that does as a community is it creates safety for us because like what Rachel said is the worst thing that can happen is for us to be invisible. And when people don't know what a BIPOC mountain biker or a cyclist or a delivery driver or any of those things, if they don't know that that person has a full right to exist and be on that trail, then that person is in danger. And I think that's something that we need to be really aware of because it doesn't help us to ignore the realities that marginalized folks are facing when they're out there um, experiencing this environment. Um, so that's just my two cents. But to Wes, my fellow Arkansan, um, I want you to talk a little bit about solutions that you see in your space, in the urban planning space, in the work that you do at the Urban Land Institute. What's the next right thing that you want to see happen? 
Um, happy to answer that. Can I pick up a moment ago on your remarks? So, uh, Lauren, or who's ever driving the slide deck, can we go back to my slides real quick? I just want to, I, I did pull a quick slide for Northwest Arkansas, the two county area, um, similar to the Little Rock slide. And that, is that it? That is it. And so, that is it. And that's our two county area. And in blue, you see census tracts that are primarily white people. And in orange, you see our Latino brothers and sisters. Um, and where is I-49? Like when, when we think about a lot of the bike infrastructure we see going in, when we think about a lot of the growth, the suburban growth in particular, um, an awful lot of the growth in the infrastructure that I see going in in Northwest Arkansas is, is not going into the orange parts of that map. And so I know there are some incredible organizations. Olivia is a big, a big friend of ULI, and I know that, that there are other leaders out there that are doing great work. I want you to know that I'm a partner with you in whatever we can do to drive change and resource investment in those orange parts of the map. And then create some new colors on the map, too, because it deserves to be more than just two colors. Yes, absolutely. I got your back. All right, what are we doing at ULI? Um, we are right now, we're, we're focused really big in, in housing. I'll just tell you really what we're focused on. I think that we don't have a lot of housing choice in America. I don't think we have a lot of housing choice in Northwest Arkansas. We do two things really well at volume. We build expansive single family suburban areas, generally where land is cheap and available. That gets you out to the edge of town, further eroding uh, any bikeability and community atmosphere that goes on. It pushes us further into our cars and for longer periods of time. Um, so we do really good at single family expansion. You might choose the word sprawl. We also do really good at garden size, apart, garden scale, uh, garden, garden apartments, big like 500 unit and above apartment complexes. That's more of a, um, a consequence of the way the finance and the, the, the capital market works with developers. Again, I want bore you but but that's about what we do really well what we don't do well is a variety of housing the sort of housing that a lot of people need um, only about one in three northwest arcans and families have uh, have children um, and so when we think about a suburban home two or three or a three or four bedroom home that's kind of a nuclear family model of of housing structure that is um, you know, it's mid 20th century stuff, all that suburban expansion. Yet, yeah, because of the policies and the finance structures that are delivering production, um, we deliver, I, I think we overproduce that stuff. I think we deliver entirely too much. And so how, what, one of the things that we're focused on doing is how do we create more housing variety? How do we do more duplex, triplex, fourplex, townhouses, live work? Um, how do we do more mixed use? How do we do more small scale apartment buildings, especially in close proximity to good services and amenities so that we can cut down on people's driving time, cut down on the vehicle miles traveled, and hopefully increase the likelihood that people will choose to move through their day using the power of their body instead of the power of their V6. Um, that is a tough nut to crack. I'm, here's what I'm at. I believe that through how I, I believe that housing is, is germane to all of us. Uh, either we have it or we don't. I suspect that most of the people hearing my voice right now have a home. Um, but we're going to go home to it tonight. Housing is germane. It is Maslow taught us. It's at the bottom, right? You know, food, water, shelter. Um, if we can get housing right, if we can deliver housing in better varieties at better price points, big, small, co-located, co-mingled in, in neighborhoods close to one another, close to the sort of places that people want to go on a frequent basis, good services and amenities. If we can do housing well, we can do neighborhoods well. And if we can do neighborhoods well, we can do cities well. Um, I'm a firm believer that, that a, a better quality of life and stronger community begins with better housing choice and secure housing. So ULI is investing an awful lot of our money. We believe, I believe, as the leader of ULI, I'm picking this fight. Housing is where we start, and I want to create better cities through stronger neighborhoods and stronger housing choice and housing equity. And I'm asking you, as my, I also ride the better part of 100 miles a week. I'm a cyclist myself. I'm asking you, as my brothers and sisters who love cycling, if you love cycling and you care about increasing the share of ridership across all equity, you know, achieving equity and parity across all demographics, I'm asking you to give a damn about your city zoning policy. I'm asking you to give a damn about the annexation policies that drive the outward expansion of your city limits. I'm asking you to give a damn about the subdivision policies that drive road creation, your master street plan that's deciding how wide your roads go and how long your block lengths are and how narrow the curb to curb widths are. These nuances, I won't give you my 
my fourth TED Talk, but I'm telling you all these little design things matter. And if you care about cycling, please care about land use. Please care about planning policy. And please show up at your planning commission and city council meetings when good things are happening. Trust me, the NIMBYs are out there telling your city leaders why this stuff doesn't work. You have to show up. You have to care about planning. You have to show up and be a voice for reason. Please. We're almost at time, but I wanted to give y'all an opportunity to just like drop a bomb on us. <laughs> I'm gonna start at, at the end with you, Rasan. <laughs> drop the bomb on me, <laughs> baby. I don't know if I have a bomb. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm here. Um, I, I do look at things that are going on here in Northwest Arkansas. I think that there's a lot of positive things going on. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't a lot of pos positive things going on. Uh, of course, we have a long way to go, and at times it feels like we're pushing water uphill. But you can't stop, you know, and that's my big thing. Uh, you just, uh, someone said, I'm like Billy Blinks. I just stuck around long enough, and now people are paying me to do things. So I was like, that's kind of cool, I guess. Um, so you just, you stick around, you know, you keep doing it. And I think it's important, and I'm a big believer in community, you know. Um, there's so many things that we're doing in, in California, out in L.A., just really trying to make sure that we have a positive impact on our community. And it just it extends outside of Los Angeles, too. I do a lot of work in Southside Chicago. I went to school at IU, go Hoosiers. Um, and I the Midwest is dear to my heart. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I don't really have a bomb. Just, uh, yeah, man. No, I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Rachel. Uh, <laughs> um, hmm. In 1894, the League of American Wheelmen said it was unlawful for black, brown people to be part of their organization. The League of American Wheelmen became the League of American Bicyclists. Does anybody have any idea when that rule changed? A guess? No. 1999. I mean, that's the biggest bomb I got. <laughs> um, I think what's really important is that we can't depend on other people to do what we know needs to be done, okay? You have the ability, the power, the acumen, the resources, because you're here mm -hmm. to affect change. Yes. And what Rasan said is absolutely true. The power of one is incredibly compelling. And think of it like a virus, like a sickness. Think of it like COVID, like an RO, right? If you go and you work with and you change the mind of one, two, three, four people, and they go and they change the minds of two, three, four people themselves before you know it. What we have is the template for a social change movement that will inevitably probably save the world. So, um, you know, safety is super important. Representation is a very important ingredient equitable housing infrastructure, you know, um, undermining Sunbelt auto sprawl, things like that. We talk a lot about uh, ridership, but the other part is ride share. So just because you ride a bike, everybody in the country could ride a bike, it doesn't mean that it's going to be safe or equitable. Um, it's how many trips you take by bike. So when we look at what we're doing in our cities and our communities, make sure that there is a direct and easy path from one's home to their place of employment. Make sure that if you wanna keep women of color growing the bike community, that you have the resources in their offices and places of work so that when they get there, they can do their hair, they can change their clothes, that they have the ability to be who they are and embrace who they are in and out of the saddle. In Northwest Arkansas, I think you guys have an opportunity to do something that's revolutionary because you're starting from the beginning, whereas in other places, you know, if you build it, they will come. We have six, 12, eight, you know, 16 lane highways. Well, we can't undo that. 
costs $10 million to build one mile of interstate highway, costs $5 for a bucket of paint. So what I encourage everybody to do is get involved, show up. If you care, which we know you all do because you're here sitting here and it's fucking freezing, um, <laughs> go to your planning meetings, get in, involved, talk to your legislators, your county commissioners, whoever it is, and be loud. Be confident. Don't show up to the police station in plastic clothes and like or in mirrored glasses. N nobody wants, you know, to be um, confronted by somebody wearing plastic. Um, think about how you would be most impacted and compelled to see things differently, um, and do it in your own creative way, right? get kids on bikes when you're driving, and I figure most of us probably are forced to drive as, as well as ride. Um, have them count the bicyclists that they see on your trips because then when they become drivers, they'll be cognizant of the people with whom they're sharing the road. Um, recognize that it starts with you and that with every single person who takes a step, then you know we're creating a, a better culture of biking for, for all of us. Ooh, Wes. <laughs> No, no bombs. I've, I've already cussed like I know. a half dozen I know. times. I'm no more, no more bombs coming. The, the I've kind of done my, my call to action. Um, I want to tell you guys how big of an honor it is to be sitting on this little green sofa with you. <laughs> I mean, like you guys work at the at, like the tactical place. I'm writing policy and trying to like change decision makings. The, 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 the stuff that I do, may not, I may not see fruits of my city planning labor for 20 or more years. But like you guys are changing lives right now. You're representing people. At a, at a moment when they really need a voice and you are encouraging people through your foundation to to change the world as, as writers and I'm like I'm blown away that I was even invited up here you guys are rock stars y'all are the bombs <laughs> like not me so anyway I just that, that's the only bomb I just wanted to say thank you for the hard work that you're doing yes. thank you all everybody here is here freezing their legs off because because uh, you're all agents for change and uh, and it's just an honor to, to be a part of this thing. So thank you very much. And thank I, I was just going to say one thing, and it, it reminded me of a quote by Benjamin Israeli, and he says, nothing can stop the will of a people. <laughs> and that's so true. So it takes all of us. It takes the planning. It yeah. takes the representation. It takes getting kids on bikes and everything else. The will of a people is so strong, you know. Um, so we have to do it together. We can't do it by ourselves. I'm going to wrap this up really quick and I just want to say I want y'all to pay attention to not just what we said but how we did this event because what we did in the planning phases was work with um, people for bikes and trailblazers and our event planners and to talk about like how can we make this event m the most accessible as we can possibly be like the reason we located it up here the reason why we have ASL interpreters we're filming this so that people who weren't able to attend will be able to watch this from the comfort of their homes um, we've hired an amazing black owned business to provide the food tonight and we're working with her set her sound for the music which is another amazing creative organization located in northwest arkansas this is how we do the work um and then the last thing i'm going to say and it's going to be a plug because for our next event november 4th and 5th if this kind of whetted your appetite for having spicy conversations like this and getting really wonky and getting really like deep with our fellow like active transportation advocates. Critical Mass Summit is November 4th and 5th. We named it Critical Mass because we wanted to honor the history of Critical Mass bike rides and their role in social change, as well as Critical Mass as a scientific principle that once you get enough reactions started, it just continues on. And it's an event where we're looking to like get out of our silos, work with other nonprofits and organizations doing amazing work in housing and food justice and biking and all the things. So please check that out. We've got lots of ways to attend, again, trying to make it as accessible as possible. Um, Lauren, I think that's it. I just 100% want to thank y'all so much for coming out, for being so respectful and listening to what everybody had to say. Um, 
If anybody wants access to the slide deck, just holler us, holler at us at Trailblazers. There's lots of links and stuff that we didn't even go into, but there's tons of history. There's lots of resources. There's books that you guys can deep dive into that will provide a lot of extra insight. So thank y'all. Thank you guys so much. Yeah.